I want to thank everyone for joining our third webinar of our series of the Fluids Engineering Group here at Southwest Research Institute. My name is Angel Wildman. I'm your host and moderator for this webinar series. A few items to note before we begin. Um, I have muted all guests during this webinar, and we'll be handling all questions at the end of the presentation. My email address is listed on the, um, on the screen here, so feel free to email me questions throughout the presentation, and we'll get to those at the end um, as time allows. If we don't have time to get to your question, then you can expect an email reply from us um, with the answers. Uh, the second item to note is that the next webinar in our series will occur on May 22nd at noon, and the topic will be Coriolis meter fundamentals and applications for oil and gas measurement. We hope that you'll be able to join us for that free webinar. Our speaker today is Kevin Supak. He's a senior research engineer here at Southwest Research Institute with a multidisciplinary background. He has degrees in aerospace and nuclear engineering and concentrated on fluid thermal research in both of these fields. Before starting his work at SWERI, Kevin worked for L3 Communications at Johnson Space Center. However, over the last seven years at SWERI, Kevin has focused on research and testing of complex multi-phase flow phenomena. Kevin's current work includes the testing of oil and gas uh, or sorry, of uh, gas and liquid separation technologies and multi-phase flow meters under field realistic conditions. I'm pleased to welcome Kevin today to speak about gas hydrate testing under flowing conditions. And now I'll hand it over to him. Thanks for the introduction, Angel. Uh, welcome to everybody on the call today. I appreciate you taking time out of your lunch hour to, or for those who are around the world, um, I appreciate you time, taking time out of your day to listen to me. Uh, on a note to begin with, um, I'm currently battling a cold, so if you hear any momentary uh, drops from me, I'm probably either getting a cough drop or a, a drink of water, so uh, that means that you're probably not dropped from the call. I'm just taking a, a quick break. And so uh, let's get started. So the uh, topic today I'm going to talk about is a, a topic that we've done a lot of research in, and I recently did, a, about a year and a half ago, a, a similar presentation for SPE, and the title of this presentation is Gas Hydrate Testing Under Flowing Conditions. And it's really concentrating on laboratory and field cases that Southwest has been a part of the past 20 years. So here's a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. So well, why do flow assurance engineers today study hydrates? Why are they continued to be studied? Uh, well, we'll talk about that briefly. And then we'll jump into the field study, which kind of kicked off Southwest Research's uh, endeavor into flow assurance topics like, like hydrate blockages. We'll then talk about some flow loop testing that we've done, some follow-on industry projects, and then we'll briefly talk about what future projects may be out there for the hydrate world. So why do flow assurance engineers study hydrates? Well, ever since the 1930s, uh, pipelines have been being plugged by hydrates uh, in the field, and, and with deep water projects becoming ever more present, the cold water and cold environments have presented various uh, challenges for producing assets offshore. So a typical flow assurance engineer these days has to go through a lot of challenges and answer a lot of questions on how do they design for and mitigate the risk of forming hydrate plugs in the field. And, and what do they do when they when they come up with design? How do they verify that? Do they go to a flow loop test? Do they, do they test chemicals? And how do they alleviate systems if they do form a plug? So do they, they go in and, and can they pig systems? Can they depressurize systems? And one of the most interesting topics lately is, is how much and what kind of inhibitor is really required. There's a lot of work and research that's being done on inhibitor development in particular low dosage inhibitors and, and when are they and required and how much do you need of them? Those are, those are all questions that need to be answered from a flow assurance, and flow assurance standpoint. So in order to, for a flow assurance engineer to answer some of these hydrate related questions, you know, they, they typically go through a, a series of what, what tools do I have available to me? Well, I think all flow assurance engineers can can uh, understand that replicating field conditions is very challenging. And, and the reason for that is we don't have a lot of 36-inch diameter pipelines around, and and uh, it's, it's a very challenging uh, fluid flow environment. So they can turn to field studies, uh, which can be complicated and expensive. And, and the reason being is that 
most most operators are not going to want to plug a producing asset if, if the experiment does not go well or if any damage can be done to their line. And additionally, you're generally limited to what's available in the field at that point, so you're not going to have a lot of complicated sensing techniques. You're probably only going to have things like pressure and temperature. You're not going to have things like viewing windows, uh, gamma densitometers, or any ways to probe your, your line very, uh, very deeply. So they typically turn to lab and full loop tests. And I've listed several different uh, items here, and generally an, an increasing cost. Um, but first, you have to determine how, how to scale your test. What, what is really required for you to answer your, your question? And that's something that's dependent on the field you're generally trying to design a, a, an answer for. And so generally, the first thing people go towards is autoclave or static tests. So what this is is, is like a glass vial, and, and these, are, these are common in the industry. There's a lot of companies that, that will, will, will provide this kind of service for you where you mix like your crude oil and a chemical that you're wanting to test to see how well it is at pre preventing hydroagglomeration. And they, they shake these, these bottles around, and these can be done, you know, fairly inexpensively. Um, what, what it doesn't tell you is, is a lot about what is the shearing mechanisms going on inside of, of the line and, and what is what any, any flow pattern effects that might, that might associate with the plugging process. So then you could turn to a benchtop or lab scale flow loops. These are generally two inch and smaller diameter size flow loops where uh, you're not really operating a, at high pressures and you may be even using pseudo uh, fluids like cyclopentane or other, other hydrate formers that can form at, at a higher temperature. And so these, these can kind of help you understand some of the, the flowing mechanisms that are at play. And as a function of velocity, gas loading in your system, and, and various other fluid phenomena. The next step up would be to do a field scale flow loop test. And uh, these are generally like two to six inch kind of diameter tests where you use uh, real fluids. Uh, you use water, um, salt water, other types of uh, um, maybe even a produced water in your system. You can use natural gas mixtures, uh, maybe with some heavy components to form structure one, structure two hydrates. And you can use either a model oil or a crude oil in the system. These are generally the, the most expensive of the lab and full loop testing options, but they will help you understand uh, from a um, as close to the field realistic case as you can. And that's that's generally what's uh, important. So. That's, uh, that's important to note that it's, you know, it's, it's as close to the field realistic case that you can get. So now we're going to jump into how Southwest Research got started in hydrate research in the, uh, back in the mid-90s, actually. And a lot of the work that Southwest Research performed over the years is funded through DeepStar. And I think most people are familiar with DeepStar, but it is a JIP that was, has been operated by uh, several different uh, large operators and service companies. And they exist to, to fund uh, different projects related to the oil and gas industry. In particular, they have a flow assurance uh, area as well. So in, back in uh, the mid-90s, back in uh, Wyoming, there is a idea of how do you mitigate hydrate plugging scenarios in, in the safest way. And there's proposed that, well, let's try to, uh, to do single-sided depressurization, depressurization, which any flow engineer will tell you that, well, typically we do dual-sided depressurization, and that's really to minim minimize the force that's on, on the plug to, to keep it from moving. And so the question was posed, though, well, can we do this single-sided depressurization? And you essentially you're going to form a hydrate bullet, but how far will this bullet go? Will it, uh, will it be safe to do so? Will it uh, cause any damage in the line? And the results from this study were published in two OTC papers, and I have those listed here uh, for your uh, viewing later on. But in general, uh, I want to talk about what this pipeline is. So in Wyoming, um, this is part of a producing asset field. It's a 900 PSI, 4-inch line, a little over 3 miles long, and is a liquid-rich uh, line. It had about 10% water cut, and they control hydrate formation in the cold months uh, using uh, methanol. This uh, this line yielded about a seven foot per second gas velocity, which which had stratified and, and slug flow uh, in the system. And so, as you can see in the photograph here on the right, you, there's no question as to why hydrates can be an issue. I mean, you've you've got cold weather around, you've got liquids inside of a gas dominated system, 
and 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 so they use methanol to prevent hydrate formation. Well, in this particular experiment, they turned off methanol injections so that we can form plugs and study more about them. And we did that. We 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 went to the field and we excavated around the pipeline and we put in these uh, these devices called bell holes, which essentially were about uh, 10 feet in diameter that allowed you to go down and 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 instrument the pipeline. And on we did this in five different locations. We had pressure and temperature at each location, and, and bell hole four, which is which was installed uh, at, near at the apex of this line on the bathymetric profile, had dual gamma units. And the reason that we had uh, dual gamma units there is that we were hoping to to uh, get a signal as a plug crossed these two units, and we knew the distance between the two gamma units. We could tell you how fast that plug was moving. So the results that we had from the study is it was we found out it was not hard to form a hydrate plug in the system. Some plugs formed within a matter of hours. Some pl plugs took a few days uh, to to create, and we did that by shutting off the methanol injection. We did dissociate all plugs through depressurization, and at the end of each test, we picked the line to remove any residual hydrate. And it actually was a famous hydrate picture that's used a lot. And you can see the hydrate solid that has come out of the line, and, and this is a pig trap here in the system. So what are the results uh, from, from this study? Um, for four different tests, uh, we formed hydrate plugs. In the first test, we likely formed at least two hydrate plugs, and single-sided depressurization was, was done in this test. But unfortunately, this plug did not go far enough to even pass bell hole four, so we didn't get a chance to capture velocity measurements from this plug. But this, that plug supported about 174 psi differential across it before it started to move in the system. The next test uh, had about an 80 psi differential across it, um, but it was actually formed at a location that was deemed unsafe for single-sided depressurization. The reason being, it was it was very near some complex instrumentation in the line, as well as a, a couple of flow components like valves and a header. And so they, they didn't want to test that uh, for this particular plug. So dual side depressurization was used to alleviate this plug, and it was done safely. The third plug that was formed uh, was, was a plug that we got a velocity measurement on, and it held about 150 psi differential across it. And the plug was estimated to be about 25 feet long. This plug was safely de uh, sent down the line without any damage done to the system, and single-sided depressurization was successful. The next uh, and last test that was done was a, a plug that held a very high differential pressure, about 350 psi, and it was a very long plug, and it uh, it had a velocity that was much much lower because due to the, the overall inertia that was associated with this plug. And this and this plug, but this plug traveled about 1,200 feet. So that's important to to note that. You know, when you when you apply models to this, to, to know what all could be downstream of the plug movement in your system. But again, this, this plug was safely depressurized via single-sided depressurization. So what can we conclude from this Wyoming uh, field study? Well, we successfully demonstrated that single-sided depressurization can be performed safely. I know there's a lot of uh, talk out there that dual-sided dual depressurization is the only way that that can be done safely, but these experiments did show that with uh, with flow modeling, with with knowledge of where your plug is, and and knowing how permeable your your plug might be, that you could safely depressurize these uh, these plugs single sidedly. Supporting computations are needed though to to know where the where this plug is, and, and that is definitely critical to note uh, for this uh, for for doing single sided depressurizations. And permeability uh, can be monitored by by uh, looking at the differential pressure across these plugs. So if you were to hold uh, the system in static state and you monitored the pressure over time, if you saw pressure dropping across the plug over time, then you know your plug is is more permeable than than uh, than impermeable. And this is directly related related to dissociation physics. So if you had a highly permeable plug, so something that's not as hard and, and is allowing more gas to flow through it, then this plug is probably not going to travel very far. It will break up a lot easier and, and it'll take a lot less uh, differential pressure in order to release that plug. So some of the things that we asked ourselves um, after the Wyoming field study is that we needed to better understand the formation and deposition processes that were occurring in these tests. And, and as you saw, we had two tests that we couldn't even get 
a velocity measurement from is because the hydrate didn't form a, a plug in the ideal location for, for doing that. So, you know, we, we did not do anything different during this whole test. We, we just turned off methanol injection. So we obviously didn't have a good feel on, well, what deposition process or what's, what's driving deposition in the system to form a plug in one location versus another. And how, what kind of tests, what size tests will we need to even be able to try to answer this kind of question? And one of the most important questions that we asked ourselves was, how do you simulate a, a field like this where the fluids aren't recirculating and, and you want to transport these fragile particles that you don't want to shear and destroy the mechanical properties of them so that way you can get an accurate representation of what's really occurring in the field? And so the, uh, what the, in order to answer these questions, Southwest Research in the, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s conducted an internal research project to study hydrate formation and agglomeration deposition. And this is back when, when flow assurance really wasn't even a term and that people were still trying to learn more about what deposition phenomenon was really occurring in, in deep water fields. And the goal of this project was to design a flow loop to pump hydrate slurry and free gas. And I put pump in quotation marks because we, we wanted to create a prime mover in the system to be able to move the fluids around without shearing them. And we wanted to develop methods and instrumentation for quantifying deposition and slurry characters. So this is really, you know, we want to be able to see inside the line and we want to be able to know how fast am I depositing on the wall and what how thick can my slurry get in the system. So the answer that we came up with uh, for, for studying these, uh, for studying hydrates was what we called the virtual long flow loop. The reason we called it virtual long is because it essentially used gas lift to move fluids around and simulate a long length production uh, line, like a several kilometer line, without having to have a pump in the system to shear up the, the fluids. And so what, what occurred is that the, uh, there was a compressor in the system, and this compressor took the separated gas and pumped it down hole and below grade in the system and created a differential pressure inside the flow loop which drove fluids around in this circle. The blue line here represents the jacketed line that was around the, the three inch piping in this system. And as you can see, we had an inclined portion. Excuse me. As you can see, we had an inclined portion. We had a straight uh, horizontal portion, and we had a decline portion as well to be able to study hydrate uh, deposition processes in different inclination angles. So as I mentioned, this is a three this is a three inch nominal size uh, pipeline with jacketed piping, designed for about 1400 psi. We used natural gas and water as the fluids, and we had several ports for visual access to be able to see what was going on in the in the uh, in the, the system. And this uh, virtual loop actually created one of the, the most famous pictures in hydrate deposition for flow engineers, which is the keyhole uh, picture. This is, a, this is a, a photograph that basically proved that deposition is the primary driver for blockages forming. Just like in a heart and like your arteries is that, you know, you, you get cholesterol buildup in, in, inside the line and it eventually envelops the flow. Whereas it previously thought that the slurry in, in the system would get so thick and hydrates forming there and, and, and eventually would just plug in the line, it was proven in the slow loop that it, no, it's actually deposition generating from the walls coming inward that's eventually going to plug off your line. Now, slugging and slopping can rip some of this deposition off and, and create blockages downstream, but the initial deposition inside a, a pipe wall is what's causing blockages. So as you can see, we, we developed a lot of, of high quality multimedia um, images from this, uh, this testing, which was critical for understanding deposition phenomena and, and kind of kicked off a whole new realm of, of hydrate setting and, and full loop and lab scale. So if they'll play, um, I'll, I'll just go through these briefly. So this first uh, video on the left is a stratified flow experiment. So what you're going to see in this video is a drop of water that was used to clean the lens off as we're looking into the flow here. So you kind of have to look past that. Um, and, and this is used to keep the window clean so we can see inside. But let's see if it's a play for us. And so it, it's playing a little bit. But you can kind of see the slurry. Man, that mouse is very sensitive. You can see the slurry moving in the bottom of the line, and you can see how the deposition is occurring on the wall. Well, that was from a stratified flow 
a video. Here's from uh, Slugflow now. Uh, let me just try to use my so in Slugflow, it's a little different. This one's a lot harder to see uh, what's going on in the system, but you can see the viscosity of this fluid is, is a lot less and you can see the slug occurring in the system. So these are some of the first video images we took of, of hydrates being uh, transported around inside of a flow loop. I'll play it one more time. As you can see, the slug's moving towards the lens, and there's still a drip going in the lens to keep, keep the lens clean. Um, we called these uh, uh, the snow cave pictures because they're you know, black and white images, and it kind of looks like snow uh, inside the line. Uh, but these are some of the first videos, like I said, of being able to capture hydrate flowing phenomena. And um, for the users out there, I know that this is uh, the videos are a little bit choppy that you're seeing. Um, we are going to put this up on YouTube later, so we'll try to get the good videos in there so you can view that later too. So one of the other uh, key components of this, this project was to determine uh, you, with an instrument how fast are we depositing hydrates inside a wall. And this as a, you know, generally is a function of, of, of flow patterns of the system, gas and liquid velocities, and we wanted to characterize you know, how fast can we, can we plug off a line. And we did this with a, a dual gamma densitometer unit. One was mounted on the vertical. And one was another was mounted on the on the horizontal, and the horizontal one had an offset on it, so that as you can see in the image, you want to be able to get the detector and source out from uh, above that gas liquid interface where the majority of the hydrate slurry is. We wanted to see those hard deposits that are on the top half of the pipeline. This gamma densitometer is also useful because you know they can go through uh, multiple different medias with, without too much attenuation. And so for the jacketed pipe in the system. We want to be able to shoot through those and, and be able to see what was going on. So some of the results from that is that we were able to detect deposition rates on the order of up to two inches per hour, which is which is pretty significant. Um, and then we were able to measure a deposit that was approximately an inch thick. And so I have several different cases here that shows you the different deposition rates we saw uh, in, in this full loop testing. And in the slow loop, we actually formed a couple of blockages as well. I, I haven't mentioned that yet, where uh, we held about 150 psi across uh, these two different blockages in the system. So, you know, we're, we're again we're taking what we learned from the Wyoming field study here and and trying to to put some more meat to that and and know what deposition processes are, are going on in the system and be able to help quantify uh, the eventual development of hydrate uh, deposition models. So uh, I wanted to put, put this slide up here because a lot of times people um, will say, well, why don't you just use a DP cell to measure when a blockage is forming in the system? And and one of the one of the point out is that DP data and deposition it may not necessarily be correlated. So here what I have is a, is a plot um, on the x-axis you see uh, in time and hours. On the left y-axis you see the uh, the hydrate thickness, which is the blue line, and on the right axis you see the differential pressure. From the DP cell on the uh, on the orange line, and as you can see, on and around hour five to six, we form a a, a thick hydrate uh, deposit, and the DP data didn't go up. Um, but then the second deposit around um, hour eight, you can see the DP data did did increase. So um, it's a little bit misleading because, uh, you know, as we know from from fluid physics, that DP differential pressure across a uh, pipe section. Uh, is related to the viscosity in the system. Um, it could be related to the flow area. It could also be related to how much liquid is in the line as well. So, you know, I definitely want to caution people that are just looking at DP data. That you know, keep in mind that there's a lot. Uh, it's hard to isolate the other fluid effects from being able to tell if you're starting to plug or producing acid. Um, one of the other things we did in the system is we wanted to know when the onset of hydrate formation is occurring, and so this, this can be done in, in three different ways. Uh, one is visual observations, and as you can see on the picture on the left, then we have a site window where you see hydrates already starting to form uh, in the system, and and obviously that's that's one of the easiest ways to be able to know when your onset um, of hydrate, hydrate formation is occurring. Uh, pressure and temperature measurements are also valuable uh, for for knowing when hydrate onset is occurring. I'll show you a slide on that here in a second. 
And one of the other things we tested in this virtual long loop is acoustic monitoring. Um, when you start forming solid particulates, we expect the acoustic noise level to change in your system too. I'll also have some data on that that we'll go over briefly. So uh, pressure and temperature measurements are definitely useful in detecting non of hydro formation here. I have another plot showing on the x-axis uh, time and hours, and on the left axis I got pressure. And on the right axis, I got temperature, pressure being the blue line and the temperature being the orange line. So what was occurring in this, in this transient is that uh, we were injecting gas at a constant rate into the virtual loop. And at, at a little before the half hour mark there, we start the chiller. And as you can see, the bulk fluid temperature is starting to decrease until we hit the hydrate formation uh, temperature. And at that point, the temperature stays steady, and the reason, it, well, even while the chiller is uh, still operating, and the reason for that is hydrate formation is an exothermic reaction, and so we can see that the temperature is staying roughly steady in the system until we've uh, most of the free water is gone, and then sensible heating is taking over, sensible cooling, excuse me, is taking over the system, and then the temperature starts dropping again. On the pressure line, you can see, you know, when we start to the chiller, the the rate at which the pressure goes up in the system is going down just due to thermodynamics there. And as hydrate onset formation, the pressure is starting to be reduced, even though we're still injecting at the same rate, because the the hydrate formation process is consuming gas in the system. So the, so the amount of free gas is going down in, in, into hydrate form. And so as you can see, when hydrate stopped forming, when we consumed all the free water in the system, the pressure will start to go back up at the same rate that it was before. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about pressure and temperature measurements is you definitely want to orient those so that way you don't plug in the ports of those and, and get some uh, misinformation if for some reason you form a hydrate particulate in there. That's certainly something that we've uh, struggled with in the past as well. So pressure and temperature measurements can be, can be helpful for you, but you know again, they're not going to give you information on what's going on in your system on, in terms of transport phenomena. So I mentioned that we did some fan monitor uh, testing as well, and or I mentioned actually acoustic monitoring, but we use the fan monitor uh, in this virtual long loop uh, to see when onset of hydro formation was occurring. So again, another plot uh, where we have time on the x-axis, and the orange line is, is the fan monitor signal, and the blue line is that same hydro thickness gauge we had from that previous plot a few slides back. So as you can see, uh, what's, what's interesting here is that when deposition processes are highest, the fan monitor signal is the lowest. And so we kind of scratch our heads about that a little bit. And we realize, well, it's because the free um, hydrate particles are depositing into the walls instead of being transported around in the loop in that slurry. And so that's something that we found interesting in this project is that the acoustic data could be out of phase with deposition just due to the fact that the transport of the solid particles is occurring and in the deposition process the transport is not occurring and they're being deposited on the wall. So a, an acoustic monitor could be a valuable tool uh, for producing assets for knowing when you're producing slurry versus when maybe you're forming hydrates and, and potentially forming a plug somewhere else. Line. However, you know, certainly keep in mind that acoustic signals, um, you know, acoustic data is everywhere in a flowing facility from pumps and compressor stations, vibrations, so it's definitely uh, you want to isolate the signals that you get from these devices. So uh, the last thing we'll talk about for, for virtual on loops is we learned that flow patterns affect uh, deposition. Uh, we saw that plug flow will knock off deposition, and that can lead to slouching and then pushing uh, these large particulates of uh, hydrate agglomerations down a line. And we saw that during these experiments, that deposition was highest during stratified flow with free gas in the system. I put a picture on the right there because I think it's interesting. Is none of this testing was done with oil. This is actually from a separate test. But if your if your velocities in your line are low enough and you have oil present in your system, your oil can actually help you um, mitigate hydrate formation because as you can see there, the stratification that can occur with water being on the bottom and gas being on the top, you have to have gas and water contacting each other to make hydrates. So if there's oil present in the system, uh, that may assist you in, in minimizing hydrate formation with velocities being low. So in summary, uh, you know, we, we were able to successfully demonstrate that gas lift can dry flow and deposit hydrates and form plugs and study hydrate deposition phenomena. Acoustic monitoring can be used to detect a hot, the onset of hydrate formation. Hydrate deposition uh, thicknesses and rates were measured using gamma dissipometry and flow patterns uh, affect deposition and eventual blockages. And a result that suggests that blockages occur from deposition, that's the famous keyhole picture I was mentioning earlier. 
in that deposition uh, can be removed from the wall through high shearing rates, which is a condition called slouching. So we're going to go into some uh, individual or, or some separate uh, the testing for, for some hydrate-related projects that we've done at Southwest Research here in the next few slides. Uh, this first one was uh, another single pass, um, or I'm sorry, another single side depressurization project where we wanted to test to see if, if you could uh, dissociate and move a hydrate plug single sidedly. And uh, this was done on an, another deep star project. And the point was to simulate a water ingress scenario. So if you had a subsea asset and the pressure in this line is lower than the hydrostatic pressure around you and you develop a leak and you had water that would uh, ingress into your line, then you could have a, a, a hydrate problem in your system. And so the, uh, the, the, the flow loop was scaled to match a 24-inch pipeline, and the results from all this, this testing was, uh, was published in an OTC paper. And as you can see on the right, uh, we did this test. You know, we scaled the, the line down. We had about 1,000 feet of coiled tubing. There's one-inch tubing uh, that we immersed in, in water baths be able to uh, to form hydrate blockages and so you can see the uh, the scale of the test was, was was pretty high even with with bringing it down to one inch pipeline to be able to simulate the links that that of this line so uh, one of the other interesting things about this test is that we brought the pressures up to about 200 bar so a very high pressure test uh, in the system and so here's a here's a really rough p and ID of what we were trying to do uh, in this test and so the process fluid, uh, was, which was a saturated gas, uh, saturated natural gas, was passed through uh, that coil tubing in a, coil, in a cold tank, and it passed again through a hot tank. And this was, this was kind of the first mention of a pseudo single pass. Uh, for, so for flow assurance engineers uh, that want to design a, a test where you, know, you don't want to shear up the particles, another way to do that would be to specifically form the hydrates in one area of your flow loop and then dissociate those prior to them getting back to whatever pump or compressor you have and then reform them um, uh, in your system. And so for this particular test, that gas was circulated and then the ionized water was injected into the system, into these, into these tanks, and so, or into the line that was submerged in these tanks. And so plugs formed, and we monitored that plug form through the pressure and temperature measurements that were occurring inside the system. So, um, in, in summary, uh, what we learned in this test is that we were able to easily form hydrate plugs, just like we were in the Wyoming uh, field trial. But one of the more interesting things was that we formed a couple plugs where the pressure differential across them was on the order of 2,000 psi. So, so, this could be a serious uh, safety consideration uh, depending on where this plug was formed and, and what kind of uh, pipeline uh, geometry and other stuff you have downstream from this. So we definitely demonstrated this plug permeability was very low. It would take years to equalize the pressure across this plug. So when, when this plug finally released, when the, uh, the pressure differential was about 2000, 2,000 PSI, it moved about 300 feet over four seconds. So this, this plug was moving pretty quick down this line. But with it being coiled tubing, and move through the system uh, safely. And so we did, we were able to safely uh, de de disassociate the plug and, and move it with single sided depressurization, but definitely uh, care and consideration needs to be uh, taken into account with this high differential that was uh, achieved across this plug. So uh, in this test, we did successfully calculate the permeability. And uh, one of the things I also wanted to note here as well is that this test also likely had multiple plugs. In the system, and so people often talk about how dual-sided depressurization is the safer way to go. Well, if you can imagine uh, two hydrate plugs that are separated by a gas space between them with a high-pressure gas space between them, if you were to do dual-sided depressurization, you could send those plugs in opposite directions and essentially avoid what you were trying to do, which is shoot a plug in a, in a direction you, you didn't want to go. So definitely, uh, it's, I would uh, take caution and examine the risk associated with dual-sided depressurization just like you would in single-sided depressurization. So uh, next project I'm going to talk about is a, a little bit of shift in gears here. Um, we wanted to uh, calculate the loads and dynamics associated with this hydrate plug traversing pipe bends. So we've already talked about how if a pipe hydrate plug were released in the system, could it cause damage inside a line? And this could this damage, uh, could it shoot through an elbow in a system? Could it shoot through a, um, any kind of flow components you have? 
And so uh, we were approached by this, this commercial customer to uh, to shoot simulated hydrate plugs through pipe ends. And uh, so we, we designed an experiment where we scaled the geometry uh, so that we could basically scale down from a 10-inch line down to something that was practical to do in the lab settings. This was a 2-inch line. And we launched simulated plugs through a jumper test section. Uh, so like a, I think most folks are familiar with a pipeline jumper, but essentially a jumper is a piece of piping that can connect different wellheads in the system. So these are short lengths of line with generally many bends in the system. So if you were to form a, a plug in one of these lines, it could potentially be uh, disastrous, like especially in a subsea uh, scenario. So the challenge uh, for this project was in particular, if we're going to form a pseudo hydrate plug, so something that's not a real hydrate, but what material uh, should we use? And so uh, most of the work in the project actually went into identifying what material you should shoot through a line, and two different materials were selected. Uh, one was a, um, a sheet of uh, an ice ball, actually, or an ice uh, cylinder, uh, that had uh, cotton balls in it, and that came from experience from our aviation industry. And so uh, we, we worked on this project with uh, our ballistics group, and when they shoot um, ice at different airplane uh, windows, uh, they said, well, we, we strengthen the ice by, by putting a substrate in there, so they, they stuck cotton balls in this. And we also chose low-density polyethylene. And the reason we chose two different materials is because it bounded the hydrate mechanical strength that was in, available in published literature. The low density polyethylene had about the density that we expect from a hydrate uh, plug, but the uh, the ice uh, had actually more of the mechanical strength that was more similar to the hydrate plug. So, by choosing these super materials, you're able to bound uh, the problem. So, uh, what I have shown here is the the test setup. So you can see uh, on the left there, on on the left side of the flow loop, there is a uh, the high pressure gas uh, cylinder. And the plug was loaded into the into the left side of the system, and then a burst disc in the system was ruptured, and that high pressure gas drove that plug through those two different pipe elbows, and it was caught in that that catching mechanism there on the right. So it's something that was anchored to the ground. And so, uh, as I mentioned, this is two inch scheduled ten pipes to be able to simulate the scale of this uh, simulated subsea jumper. The plug was driven by compressed gas. Uh, from about 166 feet per second to about 500 feet per second. So it's so really moving in the system. But those were all uh, the same high order magnitude that we saw in that Wyoming field trial. And so we took high speed and conventional videos of this project. The pipe was instrumented with strain and force sensors. Displacement was measured from, from video analysis and, and velocities were calculated in the system from the measurements that were taken. So uh, what we learned in this test is that we did plastically deform the pipe but we did this only at the anchors. We didn't, we're not able to shoot a hydrate uh, plug through any of these elbows. The elbows were, were calculated with the strain sensors that have only elastic stress only. And it was interesting to note that the polyethylene plug and the ice yielded similar displacements and strains. So it looks like, uh, you know, we, we, we did some good work there and we were able to, to properly capture the mechanical properties of, of the system. So the loads and displacements, again, were verified against simulations of models that we had conducted in-house. So if it'll play for me, uh, we'll see if this video um, will show you the, the movement of the pipeline. And the video is choppy to begin with, so it, it's probably choppy on your phone too. But again, you know, we're going to be posting uh, these, these, uh, these videos on YouTube so you can see them at your screen uh, later on. And, and, and if any... Time, you just want to contact me and, and try to get some videos. I can try to help you out there as well. So this next video uh, shows how fast this actually occurred. Um, you may not be able to see this on your screen because it goes so quickly, but I'll, I'll play it one more time. Uh, plug shot, and you know you can see it, it, that catching mechanism caught it, and then it obliterated these, these plugs. And so it's, it's a very interesting uh, test. Um, and, it, and it basically showed the customer that the risk of a plug shooting through an elbow in this line was, was very low um, if you had supporting computations and supporting uh, mechanical models to help you out there. But it is important to note that the pipe did plastically deform the anchor. So if you're anchoring this line at any potential point where the loads are going to be the highest, uh, you, you may potentially fatigue your line over time. So another interesting project we we've done uh, we, we've done for is one of the another way of dissociating hydrate plugs is to heat them up. When they form at low temperatures, we'll just go ahead and heat them up and dissociate them. 
And so there's there's all kinds of technologies that are being investigated right now, such as heating blankets and and and, and heating heat trays around lines, uh, electrically heat trace lines that are that are uh, used the pipe itself as as a resistant material. And so this this project was done to, to understand can you in a jumper successfully dissociate a hydrogen plug without shooting one uh, in the system, just like in the previous project we showed where you didn't want to shoot a, um, a hydrogen plug through a jumper. And so a 10-inch full-scale model of a jumper was, was, was created for this test, and it was dropped into a very large uh, water-cooled uh, ice bath or a, a water-cooled bath to be able to form the hydrogen. And so it was formed just like we see a rocking cell. Um, this, is, this is called the Rocking Horse Project, actually, where we loaded it up with natural gas and water, and we rocked it back and forth and gave it some agitation until we formed a hydrogen plug in the system. And so this, we are successful at forming a plug in the line. And so at that point, once we verified we had a plug in the system, we stopped the agitation and we turned on some uh, some heat trace. Uh, we tested two different uh, technologies, a heat trace as well as a, a, a hot water uh, cooled jacket around this line. And we were able to successfully form a pressure path, a pressure communication path, which on each side of the plug after about four hours of external heating. So it was kind of the first demonstration that through external heating you can uh, you can't alleviate a hydrate plug in your system. So an, another interesting test I wanted to, to bring up as well is hydrate transport uh, and pipelines. So one of the holy grails uh, for flow assurance engineers is to not have any type of chemicals or not have any type of insulation in your line. And if you could just form a hydrate slurry in a liquid-dominated line, get it to your, to your platform, you'd be golden. You'd be good to go. So uh, one of the things we investigated in this test was is that if you could form a high, cold hydrate slurry prior to entering like a, a subsea conditions that would, would that would lead to more hydrate, you probably would not plug your line. And so the 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 project looked at how do you form hydrate, how do you drive hydrate formation in a slurry at a specific location, so that way you can control where hydrates are forming rather than having them form at random locations throughout your line. And so a, a choke valve was designed um, to be able to form hydrates um, in a system and it, it essentially consume all the free water in one location, send this cold hydrate slurry into this tank that you show see here in the foreground, and then uh, to, and, and then pass that in the system and see if you plug up your line. Well, the test is, the results from this project actually um, suggested that yes, you can do that if you could form hydrates at a specific location, consume most of the free water because hydrates need free water and gas in order to form, then you could potentially form in, a, in like in a bare subsea line in the system. Uh, obviously, this is a scale test. Uh, more research would be needed, um, but this is definitely an area of ongoing research. Another uh, interesting topic is that, you know, with, with the advent of all the shale gas that's, that's occurring in this, in this country, is that so much gas is being stranded and uh, in a, in a, uh, throughout, like in West Texas and, and, and the middle, Midwest and areas like that, well, what if you could form uh, hydrates from this gas and be able to transport it around uh, different parts of the country so that way it, it's actually in a more safer manner rather than having compressed gas around, and, and which would require a lot of uh, energy intensive compressing operations. And so, so we've done a couple projects where we've invest, investigated you know, different hydrate formation strategies in vessels that you could do this at in relatively low pressure with, with cold fluids and be able to form hydrates. And, 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 the, and the efficient process there is, is we need to know how much water and how much energy was it taking to form hydrates on a mass basis. And so we did several projects where we studied the efficiency of hydrate formation techniques in these different vessels. So the last uh, project I'm going to talk about is our most recent uh, project. This is another Deep Star funded project where we wanted to uh, basically expand on the available sensing technologies that are used in quantifying and, and basically improving the models out there for deposition processes in your systems, slurry transport processes. And so the point of the project was to identify these different technologies and test them in a, in a full loop setting. And I've listed here uh, the, the top technologies that were selected in, in the project. And the ones in red were ones we actually took it to field, uh, or actually took it to a flow loop test. And the black ones were something we identified that were, that were good, but 
we didn't we're, we're not able to pull them into the project to be able to be tested. And so I'll kind of talk through these uh, individually, what their merits are. So the first one is, is tomography. There's a couple different versions there, electromagnetic and nuclear tomography. So uh, nuclear tomography really looks at uh, the, the pipe as a whole. It doesn't really focus on one area a lot. So it's not going to give you the fine deposition measurements you want. But the electromag electromagnetic tomography that's uh, mounted to the inside of a pipe wall could do that for you. Electromagnetic um, tomography, it really looks at the, the whole field as well, but it's sensitive to the wall. Acoustic measurements can be done as well. So this would be mounting acoustic transducers either um, axially on the line so at, at two different axial locations spread across the distance to see if there's a change in the pipe's uh, natural frequency as acoustic waves are passed through it from depositing masses. And the other way would be to, to mount these uh, transducers uh, radially around the pipe to pass uh, pitch catch and, um, and, and echo signals across these lines to be able to see when deposits are occurring in the system. We also took point measurements of EM and permittivity at the wall. And these are really fine, um, discrete point sensors for characterizing wall thicknesses on the order of uh, like millimeters and submillimeters. Uh, the, the, the challenge with these technologies is once the hydrate thickness gets beyond that, it's the, these technologies struggle to get a strong enough signal through that area. But it will uh, tell you if deposition did is it occurring in your system. Nuclear densitometers were used as well, just, just like we did in the virtual loop. Uh, fiber optic sensing could also be pretty powerful as well. If you had a distributed temperature sensing system, as I mentioned before, hydro processes are exothermic. You could see the uh, the buildup of, of a higher temperature in a wall. If you had a lot of fire hydro formation going on, that could be a, that could be a potentially good asset for you. And distributing acoustic systems, we, we, we saw the powerful uh, we saw how powerful like fan monitor signals were. So if you had a distributed system that could monitor your whole pipeline, that, that distributed acoustic system could potentially be powerful as well. Spectroscopy and imaging methods were also identified um, in this project. Uh, we didn't get to test them for this, but definitely wanted to recognize that there are other methods out there for, for, for helping you characterize hydrate processes at flow loop scales. So in this project, we used several different reference uh, visual monitoring capabilities. We had a four-inch side glass, a three-inch side glass, and a borescope insertion mechanism that was mounted into a pipe elbow so that way we could see uh, what was going on uh, inside the system as we tested each of these individual uh, sensing techniques. So we uh, here's a couple of images here of what, what the three inch one on the left and the four inch one on the right could show you as hydrate forming. These, these are onset hydrate formation uh, images and uh, and you could see the hydrate particles forming at the gas liquid interface there and they're a little bit in the slurry too. And the image on the right was a mixture of, of a low gas uh, velocity test. This is kind of more of a static formation. So it's even interesting that saturated gas uh, that formed uh, hydrates overnight uh, formed as some interesting formations in the system. And, and there's all kinds of issues associated with restarting pipeline jumpers and, and stuff like that after they've been in, in submerged in cold water for a very long period of time. So that, that yielded some interesting results as well. So uh, these, these images are interesting because uh, we uh, added oil to the system at some point to be able to see what oil effects uh, could have on these instruments. And so the, the image on the top left shows the hydrate matrix. So you can see in there in the, these kind of wider areas of the hydrate and this mixture here is, is kind of the, the oil in the system. And the image on the right shows uh, some stratified hydrate slurry as well as uh, how hydrates are forming on the gas liquid interface and deposits are occurring on the inside of the site window. And the, and the image down here, again, is the three-inch uh, system that we have for, for looking at hydrates uh, in, inside a high-pressure uh, flow window. And you can see the different hydrate particles and how they're adhering to the wall uh, in this test. So, you know, again, viewing images is, is really good for understanding qualitatively what's going on in the system, but, you know, we're not really going to know how thick these measurements are going on the system. So we used a radial view uh, to our borescope to help us uh, help quantify how thick deposits were getting. So um, these are a couple different images that we captured. So we were able to form some fairly thick hydrates in this project. You can see the image on the left is a little bit more snow-like, so it's a less, uh, like a, a more permeable kind of plug could be forming here. On the image on the right was, was a less permeable kind of plug forming 
uh, in the system. We didn't actually form any plugs in the test, but uh, we were able to deposit some hydrates on the line. Um, it's important to note, you know, when you use like a borescope camera, and we saw how you had to have a drip flow on the end of the window to be able to keep it clean, especially when you're looking into a flowing process. So it's it's definitely uh, wanted to recognize that using a borescope, it's 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 difficult to capture a flowing process in the system visually. So this last uh, video I'll show is shows kind of fragility, I and mean, we talked about how fragile hydroparticles can be when you're moving around in the system. And uh, so let me see, let me play this for you. So this shows a little bit of compressed gas that we use to clear the borescope window, how it moves those particles around in the system. So if, it, if gas flow can move particles around uh, like that, you, you definitely know that a pump can chew up hydrate particles and, and, and not give you accurate results in your system. So uh, last slide I'll talk about with you guys today, uh, future hydrate research areas. Uh, one of the uh, the big areas right now is the Australian gas fields. Um, very large diameter lines, um, you know, inhibitor selection for those, and hydrate processes are on scales that we've never seen before. So a lot of research is being focused on gas-dominated restarts, gas-dominated um, flowing through for large diameter gathering systems, and so it's you know it's, it's definitely challenging to scale experiments of those sizes. Uh, to 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 be able to understand and help help flow assurance engineers understand what are the different problems that can occur in the system, you know as I mentioned before, investigating different uh, inhibitor dosing in these systems is also very uh, very challenging for these for these large diameter systems, and and I as I alluded to before, testing uh, advanced sensors at the flow loop scale can help uh, eat processes out in the field. It can also help uh, processes in the um, and flow loops to, to help validate models and to help improve uh, when a asset might have a problem and when it might not. A real-time tomography is also another really powerful solution for hydrant monitoring in the field and in the flow loop uh, scale as well. So improving that technology to, to give uh, more streamlined data would be, would be really valuable. So at this point, I've, I've gone through my presentation and I hope you learned something today. Uh, I certainly uh, learned a lot in, in learning about some of these uh, older projects, and, and we learned a lot during the most recent project as well as to, uh, you know, multi-phase flow phenomena and, and all of its wonderful uh, challenges that it brings along with it. I, I can tell you that no project is ever the same and that there's always a different challenge to be seen. If you have any questions or any follow-up, you can welcome to give me a phone call. I'll be happy to talk with you. I'll be happy to answer any uh, emails you want to send over as well, and, and um, even if you just want a, a copy of the presentation, I'd be happy to do that for you too. So I'm going to turn it over to Angel now and see if any questions came in. All right, thank you, Kevin. That was a really interesting presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, definitely is scary having a plug shooting a lot of feet down a line of pipe that um, I could see where one of our clients would be concerned that that might shoot out of an elbow and be a big safety concern. We did have several questions come in, and uh, we have five minutes left. I think we should be able to address them. So the first one is, is it possible for hydrates to form from water-saturated gas? For example, no free water at room temperature, but could condense water or hydrates as it cools? The answer to that is yes, and, and if, you, if you have a constant stream of saturated gas, come in your system and you have a temperature drop later on in your pipeline that's that's condensing that water down the line, yes, absolutely, you can form a hydrate plug uh, in your system. That's particularly um, a common in natural gas transmission industry when the gas is mostly dehydrated but maybe not fully dehydrated, and a lot of times as operators and transmission companies don't take into account that in cold water events, and they have to mitigate hydrate plugs, even in transmission lines. <coughs> the second question I have here is, um, and th thank you for struggling through your cold. I know that, that yeah. it's not easy to talk for an hour. Uh, second question is, what happens to the plugs when they are pushed down line during single side depressurization and when they stop moving? Do they, and can they conglomerate further down the pipeline and create a plug again? Yes. Uh, the, the, uh, what happens to a plug is if you release a plug 
we saw the mechanical – it all depends on the mechanical strength of the plug, and that varies from plug to plug. Your plug could break up into many different pieces, and then maybe it could contact, contact a lot of liquid in the system and be transported via liquid. And a gas-dominated line, this plug could break up and then form some more hydrate and uh, plug up the line further down. It, it all depends on your, your level of water loading in the system, what, what, the, um, what the shearing rates are. So yes, absolutely, those those two uh, scenarios can occur in the plugs. But in these, like in the Wyoming field trials, those plugs disintegrated, and we didn't restart those lines. And so, knowing what could occur, I wasn't investigated in those systems, but it's certainly uh, possible for those plugs to reform with and reagglomerate in the systems. And the third and final question was: um, Thank you for showing us several experimental research activities that you engaged in. My question is: Are there software tools that can be used to study or model hydrates? Absolutely. So, <clears throat> one of the things that I didn't talk about during the Wyoming field trials is that uh, one of the first um, one of the first instances of Olga was actually used that the pigging model, and that was used to model the hydrate movement, the plug movement in the line. So. Olga can be a very useful tool, and they have a, uh, several hydrate tools for, for modeling when deposition is occurring <coughs> in the system. Excuse me, but uh, you you know you obviously you have different PBT tools like PBT Sim that's going to tell you the hydrate curves for system. And these tools also are being advanced uh, each year with being able to, to take into account uh, different chemical dosing as well to be able to help you understand what's occurring, um, if your chemical could maybe be effective or not, what, how would your hydrate curve be shifted with this chemical. And um, so I, I mentioned all that, I mentioned PVT sim, and other thermodynamic modeling software would definitely be useful for you to know what kind of heat rates you're going to see inside these lines uh, to be able to know if you're going to have a hydrate formation problem or not. Okay, and um, I think that is all of our questions. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and it looks like we're right at an hour. And we will be posting this on YouTube, and we'll send out an email to everyone when that comes through. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a good day.